Well, this Sunday after Christmas does start the Christmas holiday season. And we pastors are always happy to have three or four weeks to be able to talk about Jesus and his coming to earth as a baby and all of that. And I suppose that this sermon this morning is going to kind of be down that path, but um, it, it's got a little different feel to it possibly than a lot of Christmas season sermons may have. But I think you'll kind of catch on with me as I go through this today, because in a very real sense Jesus's entry into the world as a baby ushered in a new phase of humanity of the human existence and we'll talk about that as we go into it and so but the word that I want you to hang on to this morning is the word grace the word grace because that's going to come into play here and maybe grace slightly different than what you're used to from a biblical perspective but kind of the same. Let me give it to you this way. How many of you guys are sci-fi fans? Anybody here watch sci-fi movies? What I've noticed over the last uh, number of years, and this is not new, by the way, but it's become more proliferated over, I guess, the last 20 or so years, 25 years, is um, they've, kind of, they've kind of mushed together sci-fi and horror, okay? And, and probably the first movie that did that effectively was actually back in the late 70s, and that was Alien. And I don't know if you guys remember that movie, but the, the poster, I was in high school when that, that movie came out, and the poster said, in space, no one can hear you scream. I, I still get chicken skin when I think about that saying. That was one creepy movie. Um, but, but over the last 20 or 25 years or so, where that, that mashup has con continued is now it's about how much mayhem can the movie makers bring to the screen? What do I mean by that? Well, you have movies like War of the Worlds. Not one of Tom Cruise's best, but The War of the Worlds. Uh, which, of course, harkens all the way back to the 1930s. So, like I say, that's not a new thing. And actually, before that, H.G. Wells, going back to the 19th century. But that, that was one of the big production ones. Um, Battle Los Angeles. I was actually watching a few minutes of that on... Uh, Amazon Prime the other night because I had 10 minutes to waste and that really was a waste. But nonetheless, nothing against Aaron Eckhart. I like him as an actor. And then maybe the granddaddy of them all from the last number of years is the movie Independence Day. Right? That was the big budget movie and, and you know, Will Smith was, was superstar power and all that sort of thing. But what I've noticed about all these movies is it seems like movie producers really are kind of keyed up on the idea of destroying humanity. Have you guys noticed that? There's a lot of people who want to destroy us, either through warfare or from other planets or from pandemics um, and those sorts of things that they do in the movies. But I want you to grab onto this one idea. If you've never seen, how many of you have seen Independence Day? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give it away. I don't know if I really remember the end anyway. But um, what happened toward the beginning of that movie is that all these huge spacecraft came to Earth and were hovering over all the major metropolitan areas of the country of the world, and um, there was this scientist named uh, David Levinson who was played by Jeff Goldblum, who, along with many other scientists, were analyzing these radio signals that were coming out of these craft. And the aha moment at the first part of this movie was Levinson realized that what this signal was was a countdown. A countdown to when the destruction, essentially, of Earth would begin from these great spacecrafts. And then he runs off to warn everybody, and the movie kind of kicks into high gear. When Jesus Christ came to Earth and lived and died and rose again, he, in a very real sense, started a countdown. And I mentioned the word grace, and that's our sermon title from this perspective. We are in, currently, a grace period on earth. The Bible talks over and over and over and over again about something called the day of the Lord. The day of of the Lord. And there's a lot of theology behind that, but all I want you to take away today is this. The reason that the Bible uses the word day 
is because in ancient times, when a king wanted to talk about his absolute and control and utter destruction of an enemy, it may have taken them years to destroy an enemy. But in their tablets, on their walls, in their annals, they would say, and the king destroyed the enemy in a day. So when you see the words, the day of the Lord, this is talking about the ultimate finality of the sin and corruption of humanity. Absolutely by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that day is coming. That day is coming, it's promised, it's predicted, and it will happen. When Jesus Christ entered earth as a baby, and grew to a man, and ministered here for three and a half years, and died and rose again, he ushered in this grace period. This is the time when men and women and children are being given the opportunity to come to God in repentance, to be forgiven of their sin, and to be made part of God's holy family. That day is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. The grace period could end today, ladies and gentlemen. And this is where every follower of Jesus Christ fits into God's program. Because we have been given the privilege and the duty to tell as many people as we can before that day arrives. Because Jesus who came to save the world in his first advent is coming the second time to bring judgment and wrath upon the earth. And ladies and gentlemen, there's no one you hate enough in this world. I hope you don't hate anybody. But there's no one that you hate enough in the world that you would want to live through that. So what's our place in this? Our text for this morning is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I preached in verse 21 last year sometime, but I'm going to open it up just a little wider today. And we're going to look at verses 18 through 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. The lead into this, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Pastor Chuck preached on this not too long ago. Folks, whatever assignment you think you had, whatever you think your role in life was, when you became a follower of Jesus Christ, that assignment, that duty, that mission changed. And here's a, an alert for you. We all have the same mission. Now, we all have different gifts. We all have different talents. We all have different abilities. We all have different mission fields. But the mission is the same. Here's our assignment, verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And here it is. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, now some have said, and, and I think it's a valid statement, they say, well, Paul's talking about himself. Yes, he is. But he's also spreading that much wider. Those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And you know, guys, I don't know about you. When you attach the word ministry to something, it gets a whole new life, doesn't it? There's a program that's on TV, on HGTV. Imagine that, me and Christine watching HGTV. Um, it's called Hometown. And a young couple, Ben and Aaron, you guys might have seen them. I think they're kind of the follow-up, possibly, to, to Chip and Joanna. They seem like they're kind of setting them up as the follow-up to Chip and Joanna Gaines. And a great young couple. He's a big burly guy with a beard, and she's kind of a little small blonde gal. And uh, she's, the, she's the designer, creative 
and he's the guy that can build anything. But they've they've got this. I don't know if it's a new program. Christine, is it a new program where they're going to the new town? That's a whole new program, correct? Yeah, they've got a they've got this town across the state line that they're going to, and they're helping to uh, rebuild this town kind of from the ground up. And they were doing a preview of it last night. I was I was, I'm sorry, I was nodding in and out of HGTV. <laughs> I had turkey three days in a row. I'm forgiven, all right? So, but I was kind of nodding in and out, and so I'd wake up and I'd say, where are they now? But um, they were in this little town, and one of the ladies said this. She said, this isn't just their job. It's their ministry. And... And, and, I, and I kind of always thought they were a Christian couple and they showed her singing Amazing Grace in this little, little uh, open mic night thing. And so I, I think they probably are followers of Christ. They sure seem to have all the, the, the markings of that. But, but when they said that, you know, it just, it just elevated everything they were doing in my mind about this. And so all of a sudden it's not just about you doing this thing and, and maybe getting paid for it, but now it gathers the importance of the fact that this is directed by God. This is blessed by God. And that has a whole different set of value to it in my mind. And so folks, realize that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that whatever else you may do in this life, behind it all is this ministry of reconciliation. Now he says here that we've been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, and in a true sense, there's been a transformation, an exchange, if you will, so that whereas before, everyone, everyone comes into this world literally at war with God. The, the Bible uses the word enmity, E-N-M-I-T-Y. We're born literally at war with God. But there's this transformation that happens when you accept Jesus. And the reason that can even happen is because of what he did on the cross and how he rose again three days later. And Paul's going to explain this a little bit further down in the passage at the end, and I will touch on that. So I'll leave it there for the time being. But we who have been reconciled to God, who have had peace made with God, who now have an open door to have a relationship with God whom we were at war with before, we have been reconciled, have been given this ministry of reconciliation. Matthew 5, 9, the very beginning of the, of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaking in the Beatitudes says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I think in some ways, really, he, he's saying, if you're a peacemaker, that's a sign that you are a son or daughter of God. That's the point. Uh, someone who is a blood-washed believer in Jesus Christ, who is a son of God, a daughter of God, a child of God, that part and parcel of our existence on earth is making peace. And really, peacemakers reflect that love of their father. And they seek to bring peace. They seek to bring peace between people, but more importantly, they seek to bring peace between God and their fellow human beings. Follow me? Paul also explains here that God didn't impute our trespasses. Part of the process of reconciliation is to not count our trespasses, our sins, our evil deeds, our intentions against us. To count against us is that idea of impute. Um, impu imputation goes the other way as well. He can count someone else's righteousness upon us. And that's what he did through Jesus Christ for those of us who come to believe in him as our Savior and Lord. Because you've got to understand this. We totally deserve whatever punishment we get for our sin. We do. We deserve it 100%. But God forgives those who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and the Lord from all of their past sins, and He will forgive all future sins, watch this, as we ask Him. That's 1 John 1, 9. I know I've probably told you this story before, but I had a lady ask me a number of years ago. She said, well... Can I ask God in advance for forgiveness for my sin? I said, no, it really doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Lord, forgive me for the junk I'm going to do today. Doesn't quite work, okay? Because that means you're kind of planning to do some junk. And he's like, well, maybe you got your heart just a little bit wrong. So, but we, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness when we come to him with a contrite heart. 
So that's our assignment. Well, w- all right, so you got the assignment. You say, okay, I'm ready to go. What, do I go. what am I going to say? Well, here it is, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. And here it is. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Right down there, Paul and, and Dan there, where you guys are, there's a big banner. Is it still down there on Laco Street? It's, faded, it's, faded. it's really faded right now. And, and it says, Jesus loves you. And then the next part down says, repent. And then I think it says, he's coming again soon. Yeah. You know what it says? Yeah, it was really hard to read because it was like yellow on white. Yeah. But right down in Laco Street, if you're heading south on the right-hand side, is this big banner right there. And I thought, wow, all right, that's, that's pretty cool. Jesus loves you, and it doesn't say in the next line, but just live however you want. It says, repent. Be reconciled to God, is the idea there. But before I get there, please understand this. He says we are ambassadors for Christ. In Paul's day, to accept or reject an envoy, an ambassador, was to do the same to the one who sent you. You disrespect the ambassador, you've disrespected the king whom the ambassador represents. If you look at America today, we have embassies all over the world. I have no idea. Anybody have any idea how many embassies we have? I mean, it's like, what, 170 nations or something? And I guess we've probably got an embassy in just about every single one of those. When a U.S. ambassador speaks, he speaks on behalf of the United States president. And they don't have the luxury of speaking for themselves. If they did, the chances are that before the sun set, they'd be recalled back to the United States. And somebody else would be there in their place. And so, in very much the same way, and the reason that he uses the word ambassadors here, is that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you speak on behalf of the one who sent you. You speak on behalf of Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important, ladies and gentlemen, that when we proclaim the message of Jesus, we actually understand the message of Jesus. A lot of people are saying a lot of mess out there, right? And, and you know one of, my, one of my, I would say, favorites, but it's absolutely the opposite of my favorites. One of the things I despise most is when I even hear from pulpits people saying, well, we're all children of God which that is, and you've heard me say this, guys, but I just want to say it again. That's a lie from the pit of hell. We are not all born children of God. I just told you a couple of minutes ago, when you're born onto this earth, you're at war with God. You, you belong to Satan. You have the sin of Adam coursing through your very body. You're a creation of God, but you're not a child of God. First John tells us that, that you're either a child of God or a child of Satan. If you practice righteousness, in other words, if you have accepted Jesus Christ and you live according to Jesus Christ and you want him to be the Lord and leader of your life, then you're a child of God. If you don't, you're a child of Satan. And I tell you what, that is not a happy message today in our world. What do you mean I'm a child of Satan? Don't shoot the messenger. Well, maybe you do need to shoot the messenger. I don't know. But it's here. It's here. It's not our message. Paul describes us in this verse as pleading. Did you see that? You might have some other word in your translation, but it all comes back to that. We, as God, we're pleading through us, we implore you. I mean, guys, this is begging. This is down on your knees. Please, please, before it's too late. The word means to come alongside somebody. Literally as if... And this is where we probably get this wrong sometimes. It's almost as if you came along somebody and you just put your arm around their shoulder. And you said, friend, friend, you need to get your heart right. You need to come to Jesus. Right? I don't think it's... And I love the banner. It's a lot better than... Um, if, if you guys... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a mainland guy until I moved here. And I remember being a boy and driving down in the cities and some guys out there with a Bible three times this big, you know, just screaming on a street corner. The message was right, but I think the delivery lots of times was wrong because it really seemed kind of hateful. 
Then maybe there was pleading to it. But we, we and, and I get loud sometimes, and that's just the Holy Spirit stirring in my heart. But at the end of the day, we've got to realize that we've got to be able to come along beside somebody and share the, with them the truth of Jesus Christ in love. But we've got to be serious about it. Pastor Chuck has mentioned numerous times, and I know I have too, you know, we, we don't talk about hell enough. I don't want to scare anybody to salvation because I think sometimes if, they, if they're just scared, maybe they'll never, be, they'll never understand the grace of Jesus Christ. But guys, the very real sense is, the very real truth of Scripture, and Jesus talked about hell more than heaven. The reality is if you leave this earth, if you die without Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, the Bible says that it's appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. And there's no praying somebody out of hell. There's no purgatory. There's no second chance. If you breathe your last on planet earth and you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you will never, ever, ever, ever have another chance. You are destined to destruction and hell forever. You say, how can that be? How can that be? Because God's a gentleman. And he gives us myriad opportunities in this earth. And if you tell him no, he takes you up on that. He takes you up on that. And you never have that opportunity again. And so I think if we started to think about the fact that your worst day on earth, your worst day on earth, will pale in comparison to someone who spends one minute in hell. One minute. That we might have more of a sense of urgency, imploring others as, as followers of Christ, literally begging them to be reconciled to God. There was a video that was on YouTube a couple years ago, I guess now, maybe. Maybe longer. I, have you guys ever noticed that? You say, well, it was a couple of years ago, and somebody says, no, that was seven years ago. I say, Gee, time just poof, it's gone. Um, so it, it, it could have been in 2001 for all I know. But there was a video that was out a while back on YouTube with um, the, uh, the guy, Penn Gillette, you know, Penn and Teller, the magician guys, the comedian magician guys. You ever seen them? They're in Vegas. They, they're in Vegas. If you're in Vegas, you can go see them in Vegas. But um, uh, Teller is about this tall, and Penn Gillette's about this tall. And they're really interesting. They're kind of a Mutt and Jeff couple. And, and Teller never talks. And Penn talks too much. But Penn Gillette is a, um, an avowed atheist. I mean, does not believe in God. And, but he, he, he made this video, and I thought it was really telling. And, he, and he, made the, he, he told this story about after one of their shows, this fan of their, their show came up and was talking to him about Jesus Christ and was, was witnessing to him. And I think he even might have given him a Bible or a tract or both. I don't know. And, and, and Pendulette said this. He said, I'm an atheist. I'm an avowed atheist. I don't believe in God. And he said, but I really admire this guy because he believes in Jesus Christ and he cared about my soul enough to tell me about Jesus Christ. And he said, here's my problem. He said, if you really believe that if somebody dies and they go to hell, he said, what kind of arrogance do you have in yourself? What kind of heartlessness do you have in yourself that you wouldn't tell somebody that that's their destiny if they don't come to Jesus Christ? 100%, right? We put that in our text sometimes, right? 100%. That's a 100%. That's a lost guy basically calling us out and saying, if you guys give a wit about the lost world, why aren't you telling everybody? Because we're in the grace period. Time is short. The day of the Lord is coming. I know this. The Jesus that came in the manger the first time is not coming in a manger the next time. He's coming in power. He's coming in might. And the world will be judged. Verse 21. Here's our authority. 
For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was sinless, but he became sin for us. Instead of holding us responsible for our sins, Jesus allowed those sins, past, present, and future, to be transferred to him. Our sin was imputed to him. Then, when we accepted him as Savior and Lord, he transfers his righteousness to us. There's the imputing of his righteousness to us. He says, put that on my account. We are seen now as righteous in God's eyes. Useful as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Guys, this is not the little touchy-feely Christmas sermon maybe that I would think I'd preach today. I read something this week that, that just really shook me about this. And so the Lord... I was kind of going one way and the, and the Lord just, just, just said, no, you got to talk about this. And, and I want to I share this thought with you guys this morning. This is for me. How many people do I know in Kona right now? How many people do I know that don't know that I'm a Christian. How many people that know I'm a Christian aren't Christians and I've not told them about Jesus Christ? That's a sobering thought. We are soldiers behind enemy lines. But we're not guerrillas. We're not in camouflage. We look like everybody else. But guys, if we're hiding so deep under cover that they don't know who our Lord and Savior is, we are not completing our mission. The Christmas message. Maybe you'll hear it next week. Maybe you'll hear it the week after. I don't know. It'll come up somewhere along the way, I am sure. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. That's what the, that's what the angels sang as they were there in front of the shepherds that night that our Savior was born. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. Jesus ushered that in. It's here now. His good will is extended. His grace is extended toward humanity right now. Will Jesus come in the clouds today? He could. He says it's not very cloudy. Well, he made all this. He can make a cloud. I'm not too worried about that. He may wait another thousand years, but I know this. You and I are not eternal. You and I are not guaranteed tomorrow. I'd like to think I'm going to live for a lot longer. I'm ready. If the Lord says today, I'm ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? But here's what the Lord's convicting me about, and then we're done. Am I more ready for me to go? than them. You know? Because that is one stinking, heartless mindset. Lord, I'm ready! And then go to hell. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me that that's my mindset. He's given this great grace period the harvest is white. What are we doing to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ? Let's bow our heads.